So we're going to start with uh, the Holy Spirit and spiritual formation. So this is very exciting. So let's, go, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit? You know, um, one of the things that could be helpful when defining concepts, uh, terminologies, is to consider the narrative. And so going back to the story of the Bible, uh, one of the key uh, events of the Bible is the Exodus, where God's people are enslaved, and God then rescues them with a mighty hand and brings them out of Egypt and comes and dwells amongst them. And what we find in the New Testament is there is a, a, a new Exodus taking place. We don't often pick up on that because Exodus is not as um, profound of an event for us as it would be for the Jewish people. Uh, but there's definitely a clear um, parallel that there's a new exodus taking place in and through Jesus and his death and resurrection. So we're going to see that um, in, in Galatians. But before we do, check out the sequence of events. So in Exodus, God's people are enslaved. God rescues them with a mighty hand. God gives them the law, makes the covenant with them, the suzerain vassal covenant. And then look at what happens end of Exodus, Exodus 40 verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So here God gives them the law, and then God gives them instructions to build a tabernacle. They finish building, and God's glory comes and resides. This is very similar to what was happening in Genesis 1 um, and 2, which we'll talk more about in the apologetic class, where God comes and rests. And rest is not because he's tired. Rest is the picture of coming home and residing within his creation as the creation operates functionally and relationally the way God designed it. And that's the picture of Genesis 1 and 2 to verse 3. <laughs> but that, um, but, God, but humans reject God. R humans get, want to get rid of God. And that's Genesis 3. And then God calls a people, he rescues that group of people, and he comes and resides with that group of people. And then they, they travel. And that's the story of the rest of the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. You guys with me? So this is really, really important because if this pattern is true, we should see this pattern pop up in the New Testament. God rescues Creation, God comes and dwells with creation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so let's go to um, Galatians. And it starts in verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me, to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of the Father, God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the church says, Amen. Amen. So did you see that? The rescue from the present evil age. And that's um, the worldview of the Jewish perspective of the two ages. Are, are you, have you heard of this two ages um, the present evil age and the age to come. So you, you're familiar with that. And so Paul writes, God rescues us from the present evil age. And by inference, rescues us from to the age to come. Right? That's the implied um, logic in that sentence. So two things. One, if that's the pattern. Remember the Exodus pattern, rescue, God comes and lives with, with his people. So that's one thing we have to, would that pop up in Galatians? Would we see God's spirit come and dwell with his creation, just like in Exodus? The second important question is, who is us? Who is this us that, that is speaking of? This actually is really, really key and vital question. It's actually the very heart of Galatians. Sadly, 
How many of us have heard Galatians be described as it's the battle between law and grace and how the old um, co covenant people, uh, they followed law and then God says, no, that's not how you should do it. And they couldn't really accept that. And so they, um, they rejected Jesus primarily because they thought he was asking them to, they were going, that he was going against the law and they wanted to hold on to the law. So they killed him. Uh, because they were offending their religious sensibilities. Uh, and Galatians is now the continuation of that saga where uh, there's a group of people who are saying, no, no, we've got to hold on to the law. It's law plus Jesus. And then, there's the, then Paul says, no, 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 it's Jesus only. And in the practice of that logic, uh, the philosophy is, if anyone today asks you if you had your quiet time or if you shared your faith or if you prayed, they're taking you back to the law because they are then making it seem like you have to do ABC or you have to follow a certain rule. And so that's a false gospel, so you, you need to just not fellowship with them. <laughs> uh, and that's what's happening in Galatians. Uh, have you heard that uh, presentation or explanation of Galatians? Yeah. Okay. You, some have, some haven't. Okay, good. I'm glad you haven't. Um, because that's a completely incorrect explanation of Galatians, okay? <laughs> that's just now what's happening. And it's actually very insulting to uh, the, the Jewish people, to be honest with you, the, of the Bible. Like, it's very, very insulting to say that that's how they thought of their own um, belief system. Like, it's like they don't know, oh, let's go teach them what exactly this means. Like, how are we supposed, like, that's so arrogant, you know? <laughs> Like sh they, they know that uh, the law was not given uh, as a result of their obedience, but it was given as an act of grace. They know really well that Dutram even tells them, I didn't pick you because you're numerous. I picked you because I love you. So they understood covenant very well. They had no confusion about that stuff. So when you, when you hear these kinds of things, you have to kind of really you know, look into it a little more carefully and ask, are we importing our own um, experiences and belief system onto them and into the Bible itself? I think a lot of the law of grace comes more from uh, the mess that the Christians have committed, have, have caused. Um, you know, it's specifically like the Catholic Church and the history of there and uh, some of the nonsense that happened that did lead to workspace, like you could sell indulgences and that kind of stuff. And I, I don't know if I'm going off here uh, on, a, on a side, side uh, you know, <laughs> topic. But it's really, really important when you hear these things to just kind of consider where it's all coming from. Um, otherwise, we're going to then, like I said, um, export our own experiences and philosophies into the text and say, oh, that must be what they mean by law and grace. Okay, so that's... Uh, <laughs> I went off on a rant there for five minutes. Hopefully it was helpful. So who is the us? That's the question. Who is the us? The us is Galatians 3.13. We read this yesterday. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So what is the law? So again, this goes back to what I spoke about yesterday, defining the terms. So asking, hey, what is the law? And we, all, we have an assumption of what the law is. So we think the law means, um, what did it mean to them? And so then again, you can do some linguistic analysis. The Torah, what is the Torah? And the Torah simply means instruction. Okay, that's one word or one way of, um, just defining the Torah. The Torah also is the first five books of the Bible, from Genesis to Deuteronomy. So, when you read Gen have you guys read Genesis to Deuteronomy at any point in your, you know, life? Yeah. So, how much how much instructions are there in Genesis to Deuteronomy? Okay, is it only instruction in Genesis to Deuteronomy? No. What else do you find in Genesis to Deuteronomy? bunch of stories you find instruction on tabernacle you have stories you have joseph um, among one among many right 
So to reduce the Torah, just the instruction would be incomplete description of the Torah. So when he says uh, in Galatians 3, redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, what's he speaking to? So those are hopefully questions that are um, that are percolating in your, in your mind. And the, for you to find the answer, just go back to, and if you have a Bible, it might even reference the Old Testament scripture. And a bunch of this Galatians 3 comes from Deuteronomy, for example, um, Leviticus. So go back to those scriptures and read it in context within the narrative of the Torah. And what you will find is that Genesis 12, which is one we're going to read now, Genesis 12, it's not on the slide. In Genesis 12, the Lord said to Abraham, go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That is the promise God gave Abraham, that through you will come a nation, that's the biblical nation of Israel, through whom the rest of the world, the Gentiles, will be blessed. Um, but just consider that this fits within this narrative and how God fulfills this promise to Abraham through Jesus, the perfect Jew, the Torah-keeping Jew who dies for the failure of the people of God who failed to keep the covenant of the Lord. So if you, need, if you want to talk to me afterwards, that's fine, because it's, it's like, wow, I never thought of it this way before. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, um, that, that we, we sometimes, or not sometimes, a lot of times we, we just negate or kind of ignore the, the Israel component of the gospel. But it's, it fits within the story of the Bible. It's not, a, and it's not a story that comes from outside the Bible, as in it's an invention from 16th century Rome or something like that. It this very much fits from Genesis to Revelation. This is our text. This is our text. So we have to be honest to the story that the Bible tells us, not the story that we imagine the Bible tells us or we tell ourselves. It's a denarratorized, dehistoricized um, Bible, which is very dangerous because then we put in our own story into the story, but the Bible tells us the story, <laughs> okay? So th the bottom line then boils down to there is the Torah people or the Messiah people. Now, I don't want to, I want this to be very clear, so you have to really kind of wake up. Uh, because what I'm not saying is that the Torah people, and that, it's in fact, the Bible is not saying that the Torah people are excluded from being the Messiah people. That's exactly the opposite of what, the, what Galatians is teaching and the Bible, the New Testament teaches. The Torah people should be the Messiah people because the promise was given to Israel. They should be the Messiah people because Deuteronomy, among other passages in the Torah, but Deuteronomy speaks to the coming of the prophet who will then be the person or the, the one through whom um, the nation will come to love God. And there's a whole lot of narratives in, in the Torah itself that points to Jesus. And so what's unfortunately happening in in Galatians is that the Torah people are saying that to be the Messiah people, you have to be the Torah people. You have to keep the, the law, but also the instructions of G Genesis to Deuteronomy. And that the Gentiles who are coming in are secondary citizens of the Torah people. And that would be very consistent with how the practice of Ju Judaism was, um, how, how Judaism was practiced back in the day, back in, in the first century, where the temple, before the temple got destroyed, had an outer court where the Gentiles could come and could come no further. In fact, uh, there's a sign that says, if you come further, you're going to die, and that death is on you, not on us. So you'd be warned. It's your fault you're going to die because you didn't follow the instructions, and you came 
you, you walked past the outer court and you came to the part where only the, the Torah people can have access to. Does, does that make sense? And so that's what's happening in Galatians. And Paul's saying, no, the Torah people is, are the Messiah people because the Torah points to Messiah. And that's what he references uh, in Galatians 3, that all who hung on the cross, I mean hung on the tree, are cursed. And the curse he's speaking to is the covenant curse. This passage you're familiar with, Galatians 3.26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Again, who's the all? It's the Jew plus Gentile, one family of all nations. All of you are baptized into Christ. All of you have gone through the Red Sea, quote unquote. All of you who are now part of this new exodus. There's neither, uh, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, it's neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now that promise from Genesis 12 is available to Jew plus Gentile, all who are in Christ, who are clothed with Christ, who are baptized in Christ, who are participated in the rescue and freedom that God is offering to all, not just to one. So the Torah people was one family of one nation. I realize that's a little bit of an oversimplification as well. As in all things, a one-line sentence doesn't capture the depth of all that's happening. Just like Twitter doesn't capture all that what's happening. Because we know, right, Rahab the prostitute, for example, <laughs> was not Jewish. So we know that even in the Old Testament, you had individuals who were, to use Paul's language, grafted into God's family, <laughs> right? But generally speaking, overall, the Torah people, one family, one nation. The Messiah people, one family, all nations, all. So this is the rescue of humanity itself, all of humanity, through the Torah people. So we should not minimize the role of Israel in the narrative of the Bible, because they, for crying out loud, the Old Testament is primarily the story of Israel. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's 39 books of the Bible <laughs> that speaks to, and, and a case could be made that New Testament also speaks to Israel. But now the Israel is a one family of all nations. This is really cool. Uh, there's this concept called, concept called Yahad, which I know I'm not pronouncing pr correctly. I think it's Yahad, you know, it's the, the, I can't do that. But it's one, this concept of one was, uh, was known to them in the first century. Um, and if you're familiar with the Qumran community, they spoke about this. Except, guess who could belong to that one community? Wild guess, who do you think could belong to that one community? The, the Qumran community, or, or I, I, if you think of even one, like this is one family, who do you think could belong to that one family? And most specifically? Sorry? Most specifically, what? would constitute, who, who, who is eligible to have membership into that one community, one family? It, and Qumran Zefni had that concept of jihad. Men. Men. Only men could be part of the community. So now you appreciate the us. That's why he says one, no male, fe male, female, Jew, Gentile, all of us. This is God saying, no, it's not just men. It's all. Isn't that pretty amazing? We all can belong to God's family. Equal footing, that's also very really important. Not, not one is over and un under. One equal footing, flat, flat ground at the foot of the cross. So in Christ Jesus, you're all children of God through faith, through pistis, allegiance to King Jesus. And Paul mentioned that yesterday, that Greek word pistis, can also be translated as allegiance, loyalty to King Jesus, 
for all who have been baptized, in other words, rescued from quote-unquote Egypt by King Jesus, have clothed yourself with Christ. So God redeems his people. What should we expect? God should be dwelling with his people. And we see that in Galatians 3 verse 14. We just read that. He redeemed us in order that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. So now, what happened to the Israelites when they were out of Egypt, tabernacle, God dwelling with them? What happens next? Sorry? They do, yeah, unfortunately. But what happens as they sin? Where are they going? <laughs> That's right, they're traveling. <laughs> they're traveling, right, from... Because the mountain happens before, right? The, the law is given a, at the mountain, yeah. and then the tabernacles build, the mobile tabernacle, just to be clear. It's, and then they are sojourning from wherever they are, from Mount Horeb uh, to I the promised land, which also then, as like Jake said, leads to sin, which they detour for 40 years before they arrive. But they don't arrive. The second generation arrives. You got to keep that story in mind, because... Because the Jewish, the biblical authors, most of them were Jewish. They definitely kept that story in mind, no doubt about it. They were, they were thinking that story because they, that's what they're not thinking about us. They're thinking about their history, and they see God working afresh. So I say, walk by the Spirit. There is that picture of New Exodus. Walk by the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the f of the flesh. So again. These, I hope you guys are seeing the importance of... So if you hear of concepts in Christianity that doesn't involve this new Exodus narrative and the Holy Spirit, then you know that, okay, that's, I need to look into it a little more carefully. It probably may not be biblical worldview. So Jake practices like stones or whatever practices that if, if, if someone's doing that without realizing that they have the Holy Spirit they can walk with them and walk as a community, then that practice, whatever, even if it's meditation or fasting <laughs> or whatever that is, it's, it's incomplete. And it could even possibly be um, harmful because now they're trying to become Jesus' image bearers by fasting or meditation or whatever, quote-unquote, spiritual practices. Um, I think, I think Abby said it, you know, some of these practices themselves could be, um, up, could, be, could, be could become idols. Like, oh, look, I rest and I do this and I do that. You're missing the, the narrative. You're missing your part of this narrative or your, your role in this, in this narrative. Makes sense, right? Hopefully. <laughs> Back in Exodus 40, the Israelites moved with the cloud, a uh, pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. That is the same thing in our New Covenant people. However, this is the beautiful, amazing thing. The Holy Spirit resides within us, and we're walking by the Spirit. Do you guys see how spiritual formation is not some quote-unquote works-based? And if someone thinks of it like that, it, it, maybe we can have compassion and share the gospel with them. The King Jesus gospel that results in our liberation and God's Spirit dwelling within us, so we walk by the Spirit. You guys with me? Isn't that important? Personally, but also for ministry, right? So Galatians 5, and I'll walk, I'm going to skip this past and get to 5.19 to 26, which we are very familiar with. So the acts of the flesh are obvious, and I won't read the whole thing, but the acts of the flesh are obvious. What does that mean? Does that mean the flesh is bad and the Spirit is good? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that you are not in Egypt anymore. Why would you live like though, as though you are in Egypt? You're not enslaved anymore. You've been liberated by the king. So it's very similar to the parallels of our journey with the journey of God's people in the Torah. Well, where in the Bible does it say that in the New Testament that we're, we're parallel? Paralleling, paralleling the, 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 the journey of the Torah people. Well, please read 1 Corinthians 10. Write that down and read it. And you, that gives you a biblical paradigm on how we ought to read the Old Testament. 
and then you will see that, oh, that's what's happening. We're, we are, we shouldn't parallel their journey because their journey, like Jake said, did not end well. Okay, they died in the wilderness. We shouldn't parallel their journey. However, there is that element, the human element, where we do, right? <laughs> so the acts of the flesh are obvious, meaning you're not in Egypt anymore. So this is not speaking to the flesh is bad, the spirit is good. Gnosticism. <laughs> the flesh, again, in Paul's terminology, the, the sarks, is the uh, corruptible part of a human being the part that's trapped in Egypt, but has been liberated, has been freed, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Now I have a question for you. Uh, you, you if you don't have an answer, I don't know the answer to this question. I've always been fascinated. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit mm -hmm. is, and it goes through love, joy. That sounds to me like it should say, but the fruits of the Spirit, right? Because it's love, joy, peace, forbearance, it's, it's in plural. So I, by the way, I'm not sure why it says singular fruit and lists all these things. If you have an answer for it, I'd love to hear it because I don't know. And what is Paul saying here is, but you're rescued from Egypt and now God dwells with you. That spiritual formation, us living according to this new reality, not the old reality. You guys with me here? Isn't it incredible? And again, where does spiritual disciplines fall in all this? Well, they're tools that help us live out our new reality. You guys with me, right? Yeah. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's walk this journey together. Notice the communal aspect of spiritual formation. And let us not become conceited and provoking and envying each other. Let's not go back to Egypt. Let's not fight each other when we are traveling through. So there's the, here's the important part though. So they left Egypt on the way to the promised land. But in our case, we are rescued from the present evil age. The age to come has broken into the present evil age and yet will fully be here when Jesus returns. And we are traveling together, bringing wherever we go, we're bringing in that age to come. Um, aroma of Christ. That's another way Paul puts it. We are the aroma of Christ. So live in reality in practice and don't go back to live the new reality in practice and don't go back to Egypt. So how can we live out this new reality? So I have a couple practicals. One is know what time it is. Know where we are in this story. We're not in Egypt anymore. We are in new creation and new creation will fully be here. The other thing I have here is full immersion. That's what baptism means, right? Full immersion. And, and there's my brain in a frying pan. It, we have to be fully immersed in, in new creation. In our, in our, you know, and whatever that looks like for you, I don't know. But I know for me, and I'm not saying this is, should be for everyone at all. I'm just saying for me, I think about this pretty much the whole time. I'm sleeping, I'm thinking about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking about I'm driving, I'm thinking about this. I, I am just completely immersed because I'm obsessed. <laughs> because if this is true, this is absolutely incredibly revolutionary. And I'm now interested in knowing how would I live this out, Lord? How would I be this community? My, my, you know, me as an individual within the community. But they, I, I do think there's a full immersion that has to happen. And those who live according to the flesh, again, it's not the dichotomy of fre flesh versus spirit. Flesh is bad, spirit's good. This is the, the corruptible part of us. The part of us that obsesses about stuff. It's not like only Christian. You know, like it's not like on, we don't obsess, right? <coughs> obsess about how we look, about how much uh, ambition or music or whatever, like, you know, social media. We obsess about a lot of stuff in the flesh, in the arena of the corruptible. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mindset on what the Spirit 
desires. Again, that's the immersion into the Holy Spirit, into this new reality. And I'm obsessing about this new reality. Because I really want to bring, um, or, or really want to contribute to how this new reality is brought into the current present age. You guys with me? Yeah. And that to me is spiritual formation, Holy Spirit and spiritual formation. We got to want it. I don't want anything. I want this. This is the eternal reality. I want this. And I'm going to, you know, do my best to contribute to the practice of it humbly, vulnerably. But I also know because I'm plugged into the story, it's not on me. I don't rescue myself. How can I? God rescued Israel from Egypt. E Israel didn't rescue themselves. We don't rescue ourselves. And then there's this tension of our present sufferings, but also not, co not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. You know, we're holding that tension and living it out. So that's the session. Mm -hmm.